Well, it's, it's nice to be here. I uh, haven't had too many opportunities to come speak with the Juno Chamber, uh, which uh, would be kind of nice, I think, to do from time to time. And although today I think we're going to uh, be a little bit distracted with uh, the oil slick in the middle of the finance table, um, there's other things that, that we need to talk about sometimes, too, and some regional issues and stuff, so we'll have to save those for another day. But just as part of the background, you know, as we, we look back in time, and, and there was a little bit of conversation on the, the family. Um, I think we've, the family's been members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, probably for 50 years, because I think it goes back actually before we even moved to Sitka. It would be in Petersburg, and then, and then the Sitka, uh, and then uh, been a member of the Ketchikan Chamber for almost 10 years. So we've been, the family's been active in the Chamber of Commerce for, for uh, many decades. Uh, so we, you know, we're going to lay some ground rules today before we start in because some of the information, some people, you know, might choke or they might want to throw something at the speaker or, or something like that, you know. So anyway, um, try not to choke because I'm short on time and if we stop for 10 minutes, it, I won't have time to get through it. And if you throw stuff at me, it, it might be hard for me to finish. So anyway, what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is uh, the what I'm jokingly referring to as the oil slick in the middle of the finance table. We have uh, begun a process. Let me back up a little bit. If you look back, especially in the last like year, there's been a lot of information infomercials or what have you, uh, marketing uh, on television and across airways, particularly in the rail belt that I think is quite frankly misleading and, and to some degree intentionally misleading and a lot of scare tactics uh, delivered directly to the people of the state of Alaska for some political benefit. Um, so I don't you know, really think a lot of that type of, of, uh, of behavior, especially in the small state of Alaska. So. Um, you know, with that being said, I'll touch on some of that stuff as we roll through and, and then kind of give you a, an idea where we're going. First of all, why we're here in dealing with the oil slick uh, and the finance table and then um, how we're going to uh, move forward. But if we back up um, probably almost two years from today, there was a presentation that I had requested the three majors come in and talk about, which is Exxon, BP, and ConocoPhillips is the, is the three taxpayers in the state. I know a lot of the businesses pay taxes, but in the scheme of the financial table, 90% of the revenues, you all know, comes from three taxpayers, uh, pretty much. So uh, through this conversation, I might be referring to our taxpayers, and that's who I'm referring to. Um, we had under Frank Murkowski shifted from a tax and royalty regime to a concession system, or, or, and we called it a PPT, production um, prof, profits tax on oil. And there were some, he introduced the bill, the legislature did what it did, made some changes. Um, we all know the corruption issue going on with the VECO bill and all that other stuff that, that basically is a blight still to this day on the, on the, uh, in the legislature. And then Sarah came in and she did what Sarah does is, you know, rouses up the people and, and does whatever. But it was a real poor time to go back in and do a rewrite on PPT, even though there's had, you know, some issues with it. And I uh, uh, cautioned her against doing that. Of course, she didn't care. Um, it was a good political maneuver, I guess, for, on her part. Uh, you never want to, even when you're on the assembly or you're on the town um, planning commission, if you have a big to-do in a neighborhood, you let things settle down and you go set the policy straight and try to fix it. Or if you're on the assembly, you don't try to set the policy straight during the mix of a big to-do because normally you're going to get your policy wrong. And this is a classic example of a rewrite to a tax code uh, right after um, the corruption issue. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even ended. It was still full speed. And um, the mood of the time, it just wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was about the worst setting you can ever imagine to do something of this complexity and with this magnitude. But we did. And what came out of it was ACES. And ACES made some adjustments in the uh, tax code, which I think went too far in several areas. And it was at a time not only when there was severe uh, political turmoil, but there was also uh, escalating uh, costs and pricing environments within the oil industry. So some of the 
basis for the analysis and conclusions that a lot of my uh, colleagues uh, use, even till this day, to justify their positions, um, you know, in retrospect, uh, don't hold true today. And if we look at the price of oil at the time, or the operating and capital expenditures at the time, or even the global environment, uh, it's all different. For instance, back then there was more of a migration out of, the, of North America in net cash flow from the industry, and today there's more of a migration in. So the, the, uh, the, the table has changed a lot. So as we go through um, you know, this process uh, that started like two years ago with the big three coming in and talking about uh, Prudhoe and Kaparic. Prudhoe and Kaparic, um, I just did some quick calculations, and we're not going to get into too detail of calculations today, but Prudhoe and Kaparic, if we do roughly 600,000 barrels a day in oil, Prudhoe and Kaparic is about 80% of it. Uh, I think yesterday, the last numbers were 590,000 barrels of oil, 335 out of Prudhoe, and 133 out of Kaparic. So that's where the money's at, that's where the oil's at. If you want to get more oil, that's where you drill for more oil. If you have a problem in your tax code, you're going to have the biggest magnitude of it in that area, Prudhoe and Kaparic, or referred to as our legacy fields. So uh, the big three came in, you know, drew, when there was a presentation, parsing out I had them do it in three categories. The first one was the major producing fields. The second one was the, like the, think of it as a smaller fields around the legacy fields that have some oil. And then the third group was the guys that don't produce any oil, but they just consume cash. They're the, the explorers that are drilling holes, don't have any oil, and we pay them $400 uh, million a year in credits to do it, trying to get you know, more oil flow. Well, those guys just bleed capital out of the treasury. We're just looking at it from a financial perspective. The middle guys generate about as much as the little guys bleed. So you add them together, you're at zero. So the net effect is you got three players. You got BP, Exxon, and Conoco at 80% that basically pay for everything. And the, the hurdle that they were struggling with at the time, or we were struggling with, is first of all to parse it out and look for the problem because they were squealing that they had difficulty in their um, analysis to move forward and, and do more, uh, more uh, work within uh, Purdue and Kapara to generate more oil. And we had trouble understanding what exactly they were trying to tell us. So anyway, that's why that hearing was. That started the ball rolling two years ago and it ratchets around to where we're, we are today. But we did that then in the we had to go through an election in the fall, so we did that. And then we went and hired uh, through LBNA, and at that time, Kevin Meyer, who's, who was in the Senate and still is, he was chairman. And every two years it changes, so now it's Mike Hawker in the House. But we hired uh, Pedro Van Meers and we hired uh, Wood McKinsey, two international consulting firms. And Pedro is kind of a one man's shop, and still international. He's probably the most knowledgeable of all the guys that we've had. Uh, in our in and out of Juno, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, we hired those guys, got their data, started that process in the fall, and then uh, the governor put in his bill and, and, and Mike Hawker put in another bill. So that process was already underway to, to uh, well, nine months before the governor dumped his bill in to deal with the issue at hand. He put his bill in. His bill, quite frankly, the way he submitted HB 110 was so far off the mark, so far away from what our consultants have been telling us, it was basically dead on arrival, in my opinion, without even reading it. And you can look at the magnitude of the corrections and the impact on the state. So the House did their thing, and they corrected quite a bit of it, brought it back a lot closer to, to center towards the end of last session. We were still at that time waiting for um, Pedro's reports. He's doing six of them around the globe, uh, one of which was the Arctic, there, and he still has like two left. So we were waiting for his data, because we wanted, we knew the environment, the investment environment was changing under our feet, uh, because obviously oil prices were shot through the ceiling, um, costs were going up, uh, and there was, you know, the, the dynamics were changing, and we wanted to get updated on where we're at. Well, there was a couple of things that um, happened. We, when, when 
when we started up last year, uh, Department of Revenue put in an ACES update, which they do every year, and basically told us they couldn't tell us if ACES was up, down, or sideways. They couldn't tell us anything because they didn't have the, the data on it. And that report you can get online, by the way. Um, we also had, at that time, in our clutches, uh, the Fast Enterprise Study, uh, which basically uh, points to a lot of uh, difficulty and, and just to make a point, I'll just read a direct quote out of, out of their summary. It says, the Department of Revenue's tax division cannot easily produce reports required by the legislature and policymakers because the current system prevents timely, complete, and correct extraction of data. Reports can be inaccurate and misleading due to incorrect and incomplete data and human error. Okay? So, that went over like a lead balloon. How do you make multi-billion dollar decisions if you have, a, you have a consultant hired by revenue to do a review of revenue and they come and put that on your desk? If you do, in my opinion, you're incompetent and you shouldn't be chairman. So we um, said that's unacceptable. We knew, that, well, first of all, ACES and PPT to a lesser degree, but ACES is extremely complex, okay? Revenue is trying their best to deal with it. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the changes in the tax code were so rapid and so complex, the department could not handle it uh, as well as they should. So the request came in for a 34, $35 million fix was put in last year's capital budget. It's gonna take four or five years to implement that through the system. And if that doesn't register something, that's a lot of money. So, so that should tell you that two, there's problems internally, and three, it is very expensive and very deep and very complex, and we need to get it fixed. Because if we mess it up, we have, again, three major players in this basin, um, and it's gonna be expensive to the state, either, either detrimental to the, to the industry and ripples back against the state, or on the other hand, we make a, a, a error and we, push you know, too much cash over to the other side of the table. So anyway, we had the fast enterprise study. And then um, uh, we were also waiting, uh, and we knew that the, there was a court case arguing about the value, property tax value of TAPS, which frankly is irrelevant in what we're dealing with in, in the issue at hand today. But the point or the part of that study or that case that was very relevant is the discussion in the public that we have an aging basin, declining flow, we're gonna lose our line, um, say a decade, for, you know, 10 years, eight years, whatever. And pipe, the taps will shut down and be removed. And it's just preposterous. Um, and it was run all over the state in a complete scare tactic. So we have one of the 10 most prolific oil basins on the planet. Uh, so rather than sit and, and, and um, deal with that we just sat back and waited until such time as that you know that case was released and and what stuck out we knew that there was ample um, hydrocarbons in our base in Alaska for generations under the right uh, fiscal um, uh, status or uh, regime so but anyway, when the report came out, there was a, uh, about a 100% discrepancy in, in the reserve numbers, which I found alarming, and we're going to deal with that, where, where, where Judge Gleason was saying she expects, uh, you know, seven to eight um, uh, billion barrels left. I think when they opened Prudhoe in that area, they're expecting about um, nine and a half, and they've taken out about 16 round numbers. So, and it doesn't account for a lot of a lot of other things, um, the offshore and, and uh, uh, numerous other areas. So the point being, if you take the dollar value of, of those hydrocarbons that are, that are um, financially and legally and uh, recoverable, um, and technology-wise uh, recoverable, uh, it's worth, mon worth more money than when they open the basin. The value of the basin today is worth more money than it was when I graduated from high school. So we all know that there's less oil today than there was yesterday 
on the, on the, in the world, and it's more expensive to get out. So there's no way that that basin's gonna be abandoned. You know, the issue is how do, we, how do we fix our tax structure that's, quite frankly, he's got some problems with it. So in a nutshell, that was the Gleason case. We're still, gonna, we're still struggling with, oh, by the way, I would note, she had access to BP's locked up room and their documents for, for liquidating or selling off the Alaska assets. And she also had access to internal documents uh, that are confidential that we don't have access to. So I've had a lot of people scoff at her decision, but I point blank asked the Commissioner of Revenue if he'd been in that room and looked at those documents and if he looked at the same documents that Judge Gleason had that were under confidentiality, and the answer is no. You know, they're using the best data that they have, the questions we have, along with AOGCC, do they have the correct data? And uh, we don't have an answer to that yet. So we're gonna work on that. And, and for me as a citizen, it doesn't matter if there's seven billion barrels, eight billion barrels, six billion barrels, you know, 20 billion barrels. Um, we have a lot of hydrocarbons. It's a very rich and valuable basin. And we got some problems in our tax structure. So let's just fix it and go on because they're gonna be harvesting hydrocarbons out of the Arctic uh, probably well over another century. Uh, and some people might think that's a little optimistic, but uh, uh, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, that includes when you start using offshore and, and other areas. So anyway, that was kind of the Gleason study. Then we roll into the labor issue. Everybody's leaving the state um, to, to North Dakota, so on and so forth. Well, we're getting conflicting reports. Department of Labor came in and said that's not true. Labor's at the max. Industry was some, I no, shouldn't say industry, because that's some of the support groups were saying, well, everybody's leaving, places collapsing. Well, they either is or it isn't. So uh, we can, uh, uh, conducted a labor study uh, and found out that, yeah, it's full employment on the North Slope. The bunks are full, the bunkhouses are full. The question is, what are they doing? They're doing a lot of maintenance and, and upgrading of old equipment and so on and so forth. So we'll, um, you know, we're concerned that, that, you know, we should have more on the incremental production, labor force, and I think that's fair. But to put out to the public that, you know, that people are leaving the state and the place is going to collapse is pure hogwash. And what it does, it slows down the process because it basically stops the legislative process. We go back, hire consultants, say, yeah, that's all BS. Okay, put it on the shelf. It's done. Um, and trying to get down, to boil down to what we're finally getting to today is what is wrong with ACEs and then how do we fix it? So let me kind of roll into that. Um, we have, the other thing that, let me add one other comment that was around the state a lot and still is the marginal tax rate. We have the marginal tax, highest marginal tax rate in the world, wrong. Um, highest marginal tax rate's 100%, I think it's Argentina. Uh, we're one of the higher ones, and the reason is, is our slope of progressivity. Uh, so the increment um, uh, climbs, the tax climbs pretty fast. But then you'll hear that it, you know, it, it, uh, it's a 90% marginal tax rate. Well, if you back up several months, even though today we're at, you know, in the mid 120s or so, around 120 in, in oil, um, after costs, um, which is about 30 some dollars a barrel, uh, the marginal tax bite hits you at about $92.50, 92 bucks in profit oil, because okay? we have a net system. So, and I'm not um, supporting the current structure of progressivity, so don't misinterpret uh, what I'm saying, but what, what I'm trying to uh, impress on you is some of the stuff, in, and even delivered with all due respect, to the chambers by the by the um, uh, commissioner of revenue, I take issue with it. I mean, to stand here and tell people they're paying a 90% tax, and you don't stop to tell them that well, yeah, it's you know, uh, or a 90%, um, excuse me, or 80% uh, marginal rates, and you don't stop to tell them what price range and tax structure it ends to trigger that. I think is not um, is informative as it should be. The current tax structure, there's about, there are somewhere around a 40% margin, or excuse me, 40% effective rate. 
That's the rate people pay. We're still having problems from our side of the table, parsing out the big three, and they all pay a little bit different because we see a homogenized group. We don't be, we can't go in and look at Exxon, BP, and Conoco and see, yeah, well, they're, you know, they've got problems. So they keep giving us the whole package. And when you look at the whole package, um, you get distorted numbers. In fact, you'll probably get a more, uh, an effective tax rate about 5% less than they actually pay. So they'll come in and say that their tax rates, you know, higher than they'd like. And sometimes as a policymaker, you have trouble making that connection because the numbers you see isn't the numbers that they see. So we're working on that and we're parsing that out uh, in the legislator, legislative arena right now. So the marginal tax is, again, is not the issue um, that we need to, um, so much we need, we need to solve. It's kind of a symptom of, a, of an ailment. So we'll work on that, trying to bring that that issue uh, down uh, in probably to the 70 range, uh, in my opinion, anyway. Um, but we got to watch the effective rate. But if you look at what the uh, consultants are recommending, and even the consultants from the, the governor's own consultants a year ago when he had his bill in, um, Gaffney Klein didn't even support the governor's bill. And the revenue department couldn't even explain it. And then you've got the FAST study with quotes like that. How do you expect policymakers to make a call on that? I mean, it's ridiculous. You got to sort this stuff out, and it takes time. Um, so, when we started our process, um, some of the high points that people have difficulty with is, you know, um, and we're all in the Senate. We're not like this on the subject matter. We're kind of like this. You got Wilikowski and French on one end, and then you got some other guys on the other end. And uh, so, don't when you see somebody from the in the side note. But if you see somebody from the bipartisan working group make a comment, like myself today, I'm speaking for myself, not the group. Wilikowski and French don't speak for me. I speak for myself. Um, because sometimes they try to label that all across. You know, one guy says this, and everybody else thinks that way. They're crazy. Um, but to get, I was one of five people that voted against ACEs. So to get the 15 people that voted for it to move, you got to show them some analysis and reason why they need to change their vote. Um, one of the things they still hang on to is the old analysis from Gaffney Klein, showing ACEs is profitable. It's going to work. It's a it's a trap if they don't invest um, their cash flow, reinvest their cash flow, they're going to pay this high rate and then by God they're going to reinvest it and, and we're going to have all kinds of oil and everything's all fat, dumb and happy. Um, PFC Energy is rerunning that, those analysis. Those, those analysis were run at $60 a barrel oil and prices about two-thirds of where we're, or cost two-thirds of where we're at today. So by the time you adjust the, the cost, increase the price from 60 to 100, you have a whole different picture of what's going on. So what basically the, the um, uh, consultants are telling us so far, and we've had the first two hours of many days worth of hearings of our consultant uh, today at Finance this morning, and we start again at 1 o'clock. But what they're telling us is, is very similar to what Pedro Van Meers told us uh, about a month ago when he was in the Finance Committee. Um, and just because the consultant tells us something doesn't mean we're going to walk lockstep and, and do what they tell us. Um, but basically, the current production in the legacy fields, our tax structure works. Uh, in, the, in that, if you look at the government take numbers, they're about where they should be. Um, Pedro recommended 70 to 75 percent. And the government take is all your royalties, your property taxes, income taxes, severance taxes, all that jazz, plus corporate or federal uh, uh, taxes. We count that in, too, um, even though it doesn't come to the state. And the numbers that, that PFC was showing us today was around 73, so we're right in the ballpark. So the discussion, the argument isn't going to be, do we lower our tax structure for current production? The problem is incremental increases in production. That's where it fails to meet the financial hurdles with the industry, if you run the analysis. They're telling us that. Our consultants are telling us that. Um, there will still be some of my colleagues that won't believe it. Um, but 
it's there on the screen. We can modify some of the uh, calculations if some of my colleagues would like to look at it in several different ways. But in a nutshell, the tax bite to make an incremental in, in investment go after a, you know, a, some of the smaller fields uh, that they're looking at. Um, their, uh, looks like a lot of their uh, uh, break-even um, target prices would need to be about $100 a barrel. And it's probably a little high for the industry to jump off the cliff on you know, multi-billion dollar investments if their break-even's 100 bucks, so net present value. And I don't know, each company's going to be different and, and stuff, but I'd expect that, that the industry um, doesn't, um, in their analysis, factor in a price of $150 a barrel. To, if they don't make that, or $140, or $130, or $120, they can't make any money. Uh, they're going to have a lot lower price. Maybe it's in the $70, $80, $90 range. I, they'll never tell us. We'll ask them. Uh, they don't want their competitors to know. And, they certainly don't want us to know, but I mean, just common sense says if you're at a, you know, a basically an all-time historic high in oil prices, they're not going to use that as their target price. It's crazy. So um, we've got a problem with that, and you have several ways you can fix it. You can lower progressivity. There's bracketing. That's an issue um, that's on the table. You change the slope, change the trigger. Progressivity, I should briefly just uh, um, define that. Uh, why it's there. And when we looked at, 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 at Governor Murkowski's initial submission of 20% oil tax and 20% credits, he had 20% ownership of the pipe and 20% of the gas. But as prices advanced, our percent of the pie went down. It was regressive. Well, that don't work. Just like the industry today, when the price goes up, their percent of the pie goes down and they're squealing. Well, a few years ago, we were doing the squealing. We didn't like it. Um, from our side of the table. So we put uh, a sliding uh, uh, mechanism in there called progressivity. So as, as, as prices went up, the, the tax bite went up and it leveled that out. And as one of the four guys that uh, went to London took a class and we learned about that little maneuver in dealing with, um, dealing with uh, gas regimes. Um, so we put that in to protect the state so it got the same percent of the pie as, as prices changed and went up. Well, in the negotiations in PPT, it ended up being a little bit higher than we initially put in, and not high enough to you know, change the world. Um, but under ACES, it went from 0.2 to 0.4, it doubled. And nobody that I know of in the legislature did any analysis on it, and it was a political maneuver. Um, came out of, I think, an economist out of Anchorage. But anyway, uh, so that rate is so high at the 100 uh, and 120, 140, it distorts, it distorts the financial um, analysis. So anyway, it, again, initially what it's there for is to protect, was to protect the state. So our percent of the pie didn't decrease as prices went up, but now it's been jacked up so high that our percent continues to climb and basically there's no there is no ceiling for all practical purposes. Um, technically, there's a mechanical, mathematical ceiling, but if prices of oil get that high, uh, costs are gonna be rising and it's a net game, so we'll probably never get there. So you'll see discussions on trying to level, even under the current production and the current fields, level that split at some point um, so the split stays constant. So if the price, give you an extreme example, because I don't know where the price freezing point's going to be, it's going to be certainly less than $140 a barrel. So I'm going to use that to $150 or 160 The percent of the split will stay the same. And maybe we make it at 120 maybe we make it at 100 maybe we make it at 90 I have no idea. Pedro was saying that north of 100 you got to start having problems. You'll see a lot of analysis running at $100 a barrel. That seems to be the tipping point where our problems start and they disappear south of 100. But we need to get, um, or we need to have a structure that, that um, Prudhoe and Kaparic can function under, and the folks with the leases, the big three, can go after these incremental projects. Because what we want to do is not accept the 6%, 5, 6% decline curve. 
it's not good for the state. I can get into budget stuff and all that other stuff, but you know, you don't have to be a mathematician to know that you know, you're better off at 600,000 barrels a day than 400,000 barrels a day, uh, regardless of the price. So the industry is paying and spending a lot of money to slow our decline to 6%. I don't think they get as much credit for it as, as they deserve. But if we, we'll be having a lot of discussion of what it takes to slow it to 2% or 1% or increase one or increase two. Um, it's gonna be very expensive. It's not gonna be, and I'll just venture to guess, the consultants will speak for themselves and so will the industry, but if I had to you know, um, stick my neck out and, and cause I figured one of the questions will be the, the um, $5 billion that have been discussed uh, that the industry, two of the three firms talked about you know, over a period of several years, if it's seven, eight, nine years, whatever, to help do that, this is nothing. It doesn't work. You probably need three to four billion a year to turn this around. So you need a huge amount of capital. So it's nice that they have put five billion on the table, but when we start hearing them talk about three billion a year, then we know we've got a chance of slowing this down. And I'd expect, and I don't know if it's gonna be three, but our consultants will work on that, and they've been meeting with all three of the major producers, and they'll come up with their own opinion. But I'd be absolutely floored if they tell us that if the, if the three majors, if we fixed our tax structure, assume it's fixed and everybody's happy, they do another five billion in incremental expenditures. Um, you know, we, our basin's too old. Costs are too high. Um, uh, Prudhoe being such a prolific field in this age, it's just gonna take a lot of money. So anyway, uh, we'll let that all fold out. I'm sure the three majors will come in and tell us what they think, and our consultants will tell us what they think. But um, if I was a betting man, it's not five billion dollars. Um, it's a lot more than that. And we're never gonna get there under, under ACES. The testimony today was ACES works if you just wanna have a harvest policy. If you just want them to sit and run their pumps, and um, you know, be fat, dumb, and happy. It works fine, it's good, I mean, that's, that's what it does. But is that what we want from a policy perspective in the state? And I'd argue no, that we want to stop that decline curve. And I think we'll, we'll have some discussion on that, and I think we'll have a consensus agreement in the legislature that that's in fact what we want to do. We want to at least slow it down. Um, I would not um, stand before you and tell you that we can get to a billion, or excuse me, a, uh, yeah, a million barrels a day, uh, and we're all gonna be happy because we're not gonna get there unless we get offshore or somewhere else. You know, if we can stabilize it at 600, we should be pretty darn happy. And if we can incrementally over the years get it to seven off of state land, I mean, we're, we're doing great, I think. Uh, a million barrels, uh, you're not gonna get it. Uh, I don't think you'd get it if you had a zero tax. Uh, so it was a good bumper sticker. The other, uh, um, there's other opportunities offshore that'll help us fill the line and reduce our tariffs. And we all understand that the lower the volume, eventually you get into waxing and temperature issues and you know mechanical issues. And what we're concentrating here is on the financial aspects of it, not so much the mechanical. We'll let the TAPS crew uh, figure out the mechanical. Uh, and we're gonna try to figure out the tax structure that allows uh, the production to increase. I um, have about a few more minutes. I think I'm gonna just stop and open it up for questions because I think it'd be more beneficial to, an to answer uh, questions than just, just go on, so go ahead. And it's open season, you can ask anything you want. How's that? That's good. So, uh, you know, with a lot of time been spent here the last... Uh, well, go ahead and identify yourself so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Smith. I'm from Anchorage. I'm one of the rail bell people. Okay. But, uh, um, so, Senator, there's been a lot of time spent on two ends of this price spectrum. We seem to be a lot of focus on $200 oil, what happens in these graphs, um, having a minimum tax if it goes to 40 I mean, it seems like some people are kind of off in those areas, mm -hmm. and those two price ranges are probably unrealistic mm -hmm. um, by anybody's forecast. 
And I just kind of wonder, you know, what, what are you going to have in mind to bring people back to the probable reality of 60 to 140 dollar crude and a tax structure that works well in those price ranges? I think that's a, that's a good question, and, and actually, I think your your um, your uh, band of pricing is a lot more accurate. I think those graphs that go out to 200, I've seen some to 300. We'll never have an oil price at that magnitude without huge increases in operating capital costs. We're never going to be there. It's just kind of an example of of, of just kind of a static relationship holding operating and capital costs fixed. It's not reality. We will be bringing those in and looking at maybe it's 40 or 30 to, uh, I don't know, 150 or... But in my opinion, at 150, at least, I mean, that's, it's going to be below that, but at 150, it, it's not even... We don't, shouldn't have to worry about looking above it because we should have a fixed split with the industry. So it won't matter. I mean, they'll get their cut. Because right now what happens, and I wish I had a little chart with me, if you look at the, the share... Um, you know, if 80% if, if goes to the state and 20% goes to them, uh, you know, and you have an increment of $10, $10 billion in price, gross price, I mean, it, you could see why they're squealing. I mean, we'd be squealing if we were the state. So uh, I understand that, but you're correct that these price ranges, they're kind of conceptual. They're not relevant. The floor issue will be discussed later on um, as a decision. <laughs> Uh, meaning that our, our production tax could go negative, the credit swing against our revenue and it drives it to a negative number. Um, after we look at, in my opinion, we should adjust the tax structure in the upper price range first because it affects how it works at the lower price range. But you're correct that, that you know, wasting your time at $230, you're just whistling in the wind. Thanks, Senator Mark Ryan from the Truman Empire. You made a statement that as, their, as the price of oil goes up, goes, so does their costs. Could you clarify what costs are rising? Well, you, both operating and capital expenditures. We had a chart today, I, I thought put it in, in, a, in a, um, uh, a good context. It started, I think, in the year 2000. It started at $100 or, or 100%, and it was worldwide. They had onshore, offshore, they had, um, they had it broken down three, four different ways. Um, and they just showed how that operating and capital costs climbed over time. And thinking back when we did, uh, 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 I think it was PPT, I think it was Conoco came in and testified that we're facing increasing operating and capital costs. In fact, it was original PPT. At this time, we see it in the marketplace, and we promptly ignored them. What happened? We adopted PPT. They were right. We came back a couple years later and said, how come your costs are so high? you know, our, our net revenue is lower than we thought. They were actually telling us what they were seeing and we weren't listening. And this chart that we saw today actually captures that time frame plus more. Uh, another way of, another thing in the industry that we don't really talk about what they face is um, price goes up, say the price jumps up 30 bucks, 40 bucks, which is, you know, from 70 to $100 or whatever, you know, 80 to, to 110. Um, the service guys and gals want a bigger cut of the higher price. They're raising their operating and capital costs to the supplies, steel, trucks, all that other good stuff. Mm -hmm. But the margin, the increased margin going to the, going to the industry is shrinking. The state has taken the most of it, right? The 80% of it or what have you, depending on the, on the dollar frame. So all this price compression is coming into a smaller and smaller slice. So they're not only getting squeezed from the state, they're getting squeezed from their support guys. And we don't talk about it much. It's mentioned and it doesn't register to a lot of people, but uh, it's, it's one of the problems that they have. And that's a thing we can't do much about it other than if we had a stable split, you know, that would give the industry more of a, a cushion. But we have had testimony today that the infield drilling is very profitable to the industry. They're profitable today. Um, the problem is our incremental increases in our declining production. And this stuff, I mean, they're on the, and we got all these studies, they're on the website, so you want to read the FAST study, you want to read any of this stuff, you can go on there and get it. But, but there's a slide that talks about that in a much longer term, globally. And then, you know, we can take, bring them down into North America or, or even Alaska. Senator, uh, 
Southeast Conference is meeting, oh, my name is Brad Flitch, Alaska Internet Network. I was, uh, um, Southeast Conference is meeting and their first discussion was about the Southeast Alaska Integrated Resource Plan. And I was wondering if you could make a few comments um, on that plan. Well, I'm out of time and I want to have, there's a question over here, hopefully it's on oil, but I'll tell you the plan should go into shredder and we should build hydros, in my opinion. That's better than having stuff thrown at me like when we're dealing with the oil. Go ahead. The question I have that relates to Southeast Alaska is not on oil, but it's about the 90% of federal lands that surrounds us. Uh, in your speech, uh, remarks to the Southeast Conference uh, touched upon the possibility of opportunities to get private land and state land in, in uh, Southeast Alaska. And I, if you could, just in a couple minutes. Uh, Give a snapshot. Okay. What that, what that could mean for Southeast Alaska. Well, what, we're, what, what I'm doing is hijacking a bill from one of my colleagues, which I've been known to do from time to time, and put a little paragraph in there that basically asked the governor to um, uh, start, you know, have discussions with the, uh, the federal government by the Tongas. And if they don't want to sell it to us, which they won't, I understand that, uh, try to open up the Statehood Act and make some land selections in Southeast because we were blocked from that is my understanding because we had 50 year timber contracts at the time which they canceled. Uh, so they're in my opinion responsible to the to Southeast to help us deal with the issue that they basically gifted us which is declining, uh, declining uh, standards of living and declining the population. So uh, anyway we're, we're working with that and you know the, the um, I don't see I think we could make a legitimate argument to open up the statehood pack and, and have that conversation and get some land around our communities because we're so constrained. And you look at the population projections, it's pretty ugly for Southeast. Well, with that, I got to run up to do, um, continue the hearing with PFC Energy. I know everybody's busy with their own little lives and world, and, um, but some of this information is very good and, and it's interesting. Um, and we're gonna take the time it takes to get this right uh, and hopefully lead my uh, colleagues that supported ACES uh, to the conclusion that they need to make some changes and we get enough votes and we make some changes. And thank you. Mm -hmm.